section that I'm going to read for you is um, a particular night when he has been told by some soldiers that have come into his hospital to take care of a 16-year-old torture victim so that she can go back for more interrogation and, and most likely further torture. So Heine of the doctor is faced with what he's going to do at that point. Um, the scene that I will read for you takes place after one particular shift at the hospital. The human heart, Heine knew, can stop for many reasons. It is a fragile, hollow muscle, the size of a fist, shaped like a cone, divided into four chambers, separated by a wall. Each chamber has a valve. Each valve has a set of, a set of flaps as delicate and frail as wings. They open and close, open and close, steady and organized, fluttering against currents of blood. The heart is merely a hand that is closed around empty space, contracting and expanding. What keeps the heart going is a constant, unending act of being pushed and a relentless, anticipated response of pushing back. Pressure is the life force. Heidel understood that a change in the heart can stall a beat. It can flood arteries with too much blood and violently throw its owner into pain. A sudden jerk can shift and topple one beat onto another. The heart can attack. It can pound relentlessly on the walls of the sternum, swell and squeeze roughly against lungs until it cripples its owner. He was aware of the power and frailty of this thing he felt bumping now against his chest, loud and fast in his empty living room. A beat. The first push and nudge of pressure in the heart, he knew, was generated by an electrical impulse in a small bundle of cells tucked into one side of the organ. But the pace of the syncopated beats was affected by feeling, and no one, least of all he, could comprehend the sudden, impulsive, lingering control emotions played on the heart. He had once seen a young patient die from what his mother insisted was a crumbling heart that had finally collapsed on itself. A missing beat can tell a man. A healthy heart can be stilled by nearly anything. Hope, anguish, fear, love. A woman's heart is smaller, even more fragile than a man's. It wouldn't be so surprising then that the girl had died. Heidi would simply point to her heart. It would be enough to explain everything. He'd been alone in the room, the soldiers smoking outside. He could see their shadows lengthening, lengthening over the bare and brittle lawn as the sun swung low, then lowered and finally sank under the weight of night. It was easy to imagine that the dark blanket outside had also swept into the hospital room, even though the lights were on. It was the stillness, the absolute absence of movement, which convinced him that they too, this girl and he, were just an extension of the heaviness that lay beyond the window. <coughs> She'd been getting progressively better, had begun to wake for hours at a time and gaze, terrified, at the two soldiers sitting across from her. The soldiers had watched her recovery with relief, then confusion, and eventually guilt. Heidi could see their shame, keeping them hunched over monotonous card games. It hadn't been so difficult to get the sign right. He simply walked into the supply office behind the pharmacy counter waved at the board pharmacist and pulled the cyanide from a drawer that housed the dwindling supply of penicillin. Back in the room, Heidi prayed and made the sign of the cross over the girl. Then he opened her mouth and slipped the tiny capsule between her teeth. What happened next happened without the intrusion of words, without the clash of meaning and language. The girl flexed her jaw and tugged at his hand, so he was forced to meet her stare. Terror had made a home in this girl, and this moment was no exception. She shivered, though the night was warm and the room hotter. Then she pushed her jaw shut, and Heidi heard the crisp snap of the capsule and the girl's muffled groan. The smell of almonds, sticky and sweet, rose from her mouth. She gasped for air, but Heidi knew she was already suffocating from the, from the poison. She was choking. She took his hand and moved it to her heart and pressed it down. He wanted to think that last look before she closed her eyes was gratitude. It was only Alamas who recognized the vivid flush of the girl's face, the faint hint of bitter almonds and know what had happened. 
She walked in just as Heidi was explaining to the soldiers how the electric shocks she received had damaged her internally. Oh, Alma said. Yes, she collected herself. It was too much for her, too much infection. The soldiers had been agitated. They paced back and forth. They asked Heidi again and again to explain exactly what happened. The infection was climbing from her feet to her heart, he repeated. There was no way to stop it. She was too weak to fight it. But she was waking up, getting better, they said. Tyler's palms were sweaty. He heard a ringing in his ears that seemed to get louder as he talked. He cleared his throat. He was a surprise for all of us. I'll write up the, birth, the death certificate, Tyler said. Everything will be explained there. But now, Tyler sat at his desk. He'd been summoned to the jail officially. His presence was requested in writing, delivered to him by three skinny soldiers who spoke in unison. You were told to come in. We spoke to your friend. Here's a written order. Come to the jail tomorrow. Arrive by dawn, they said. The colonel wakes up early. What's this about? Heidi looked at the ink signature at the bottom of the letter and tried to imagine the man whose hand moved across the page with such jagged sweeps of the pen. I have to work tomorrow morning or schedule for surgery. Two of them turned to look at the third soldier. He stepped forward. Please don't disobey orders, he said. Should I bring a suitcase, Heidi asked. Most prisoners were ordered to bring a suitcase of clothes under the pretext they returned home eventually. Soldiers took the suitcases and added to their wardrobe, many of them wearing to bars and parties the clothes of those they'd executed. You won't need to, the third soldier said. Hyden tried not to think about the fact that no one he knew ever returned from a summons to jail. Tomorrow, they said, before walking out of the office. Don't disobey this time. Now, Hyden sat in his chair with the lights off. He sat with his back straight to the tree and waited. Though for what, he wasn't sure.